This week, we're going to cover the second part of the behaviorism lecture. We're going to learn about several of the neo-behaviorists, including B.F. Skinner, who contributed to the expansion of this school of thought in the 1920s and the 1930s. We will learn about some of the events that contributed to the expansion of behaviorism. We will look at the contributions of Edward Tolman, Clark Hull, and B.F. Skinner. We will finish with just a brief comparison of operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Let's start with the zeitgeist of the 1920s and the 1930s. There were several things going on during the time that helped behaviorism become such a popular and important force in psychology. Had it not been for these four things we're going to cover on the next few slides, behaviorism may not have become as popular as it did at the time. It may have happened earlier, it may have happened later. The important thing to remember is that these four things, these four reasons contributed to the expansion of behaviorism in the 1920s and the 1930s. Reason number one, Americans wanted a practical psychology, something that could help them raise their children, improve their marriages, do better at work, change things in their communities. They wanted psychology to provide value to their everyday lives. And we've already talked about this reason in several other lectures. I'm just bringing it up once again to show you that this idea, this very American idea was important to the field of psychology. It impacted the expansion of behaviorism, gestalt psychology, applied psychology, mental testing. All of these different ideas were able to grow within the field of psychology because they attempted to provide everyday value and be useful to the everyday American citizen, not just psychologists. Reason number two, Ivan Pavlov's work was translated into English. He published it in Russian. It took several years before it was all translated into English for American psychologists. Once they got their hands on his methods, his procedures, his descriptions of how he conducted his experiments, they were blown away. And eventually his whole program of research would become a model for American psychologists and American psychology departments. The training that we all receive today in graduate school is very much connected to Ivan Pavlov's program of research. The way that he went about conducting his research influenced how we conducted research in the field for decades. And there are still things today that we do that Pavlov did, things that he introduced to the field of psychology. Reason number three, a physicist, Percy Bridgman, introduced several concepts in 1927. And these concepts became of interest to American psychologists. Logical positivism and operationalism. These are two fancy terms for concepts that you are probably familiar with today if you've taken research methods. The first one, logical positivism, is the idea that the observable behaviors should be distinguished from the unobservable, things like emotions, thoughts, motivation. Those two things should be distinguished. And the focus should be on the observable. Unobservable entities, unobservable processes can be studied only if they can be tied to the observable, to behaviors. So according to this idea, and remember, this idea comes from physics, not from psychology. The idea is you have to be able to see something in order to study it. 
we can make inferences about the things we can't see so long as we have observable evidence, so long as we can see some things, we can make broader conclusions. Now, his second idea, operationalism, has to do with how we define, how we operationalize our concepts, our variables in our studies. In the field of physics, it was very important for researchers to be clear about what they were studying. Hence, this idea of defining, you know, concepts, not so much in, in absolute terms, but relative to our situation. How are we defining these different variables that we're studying? So, for instance, if we're looking at something like hunger, like many of the early psychologists and physiologists did, if we're looking at something like hunger and we ask the question, you know, how does hunger influence emotions? Think about those Snickers commercials we all see, right? If you don't eat, if your blood sugar is low, you're cranky. Let's investigate that. How does hunger impact emotions? Well, Bridgman and psychologists alike would want to know, what do you mean by hunger? What do you mean by emotions? How are you defining that? How are you going to measure that? What exactly do you mean when you say hunger? Are you just going to ask people on a scale from zero to 10, how hungry are you? Are you going to take samples from their blood? Are you going to test their blood sugar? Are you going to wait until people pass out? What is, what is your plan here? How are you going to study these variables? You wouldn't be able to wait until people passed out, by the way, but how were you in your study defining your variables? This idea of defining our variables very specifically and in relation to our study, um, this idea comes from the late 1920s and it comes from a physicist. Reason number four, after World War I, there were four people, Guthrie, Tolman, Hull, and B.F. Skinner, who completed their doctorates and began studying their own topics, their own ideas. They all shared several things in common. They used the experimental method. Behaviorists did not use introspection or subjective methods like it. They relied on the experimental method. They tried to maintain control over different variables in their studies. They conducted them mostly in labs and mostly with animals. At least at first, behaviorists studied animals. Later, there was more pressure for them to more directly study human behavior. But at first, they focused mostly on, on small animals, just like the physiologists did in the 1800s. Rats, bunnies, pigeons, they are easy to breed. They're easy to keep in cages and just clean up after. They don't require a lot of space, a lot of training. They were very convenient for many of the early physiologists and early behaviorists. Obviously, behaviorists focused on behavior, but they also paid attention to the environment. Remember Charles Darwin. Darwin said that we change, we evolve based on the environment. Many of the functionalists and behaviorists had similar ideas about behavior. The reason we all act the way that we do is because it provides us some kind of advantage in our environment. If our environment changes, then our behaviors might need to change as well. So they were interested in how the environment shapes our behaviors. They were also interested in learning. They wanted to know how do animals learn? How do they remember? How do they learn best? What kinds of things prevent learning from happening? They were interested in all the ins and outs of how animals and humans learn. Ultimately, their goal was to control behavior to be able to predict a behavior 
according to the environment and then to be able to make changes to that environment to impact that behavior. The ultimate goal was predict and control behavior. 